Monday morning, family. It's Lady Mara with this week's VP News and Views. Here at Vernon Park, we celebrate Christian marriages. John and Shirley Hill, 54 years on February 28th. Children's Church takes place every Sunday following praise and worship, excluding Fifth Sundays. Calling all men, join the Men of Destiny, third Saturdays monthly, 12.30 to 2.30. This is the last Sunday of Black History Month, and we want to remind you, the QR code is posted throughout the lobby. Please be sure to scan it, upload your photo. You can also post them on social media, hashtag VPCOG. Also, the family tree photos will be returned the first Sunday in March. Last but certainly not least, today we're sporting our Black History Is Me t-shirt, red, black, and green, or other African garb. We're going to do a group family photo directly following service. You guys look fabulous. Family, our training and classes has already started and will run through April the 9th, 8.30 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. New members class will be offered in the Holmes Conference Room. If you have joined Vernon Park within the last two years and haven't completed new members class, this class is for you. Please see the Brown family. Children and youth ministry training will take place in Children's Church. Also, discipleship class will take place in room 103 and deacons training will take place in the worship area. Family, the war room is now available for you to go and write out your prayers, speak your prayers, pray for other countries and other people. If you have a private or personal prayer, please feel free to place it inside the wooden box in the war room. Thank you. Be blessed, be encouraged, and let's bombard heaven. We are a family that prays together. Please keep the names on our sick list in your prayers. Sister Noreen Chin. Brother Walter Mitchell. Sister Lindsay Dark. Sister Theodora Barnett Bolden. Sister Laureen Johnson. And pray for our bereaved Sister Regina and the entire Turner family and also Catherine Golden and the loss of their cousin, Sister Cherry Lynn Allen Curley. Deaconess Mildred and Daryl Robinson and the loss of her cousin, Brother Donovan Walker. Trustee Harold Beatty and family and the loss of his aunt, Sister Maddie Simmons, Mother Tucker and the Tucker family and the loss of their cousin, Brother Linton Johnson Jr. Sister Rashonda Anderson and the loss of her mother, Sister Bessie Warren and also the entire Vanderbilt family and the loss of their aunt and great aunt. Sister Arlene Coleman and family and the loss of her brother, Larry Coleman. Brother Ken and Jackie Morris and the loss of his brother, Darnell Morris. Family, today's the day, Sunday, February the 26th at 6 o'clock Central. You can catch me, Lady Mara, in a Nashville legacy. It'll take place on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. Be sure to tune in. Tell your friends and family to tune in. And don't forget to set the DVR if you can't watch it live. Thank you in advance for your prayers and support. Well, family, that concludes the video announcements for VP News and Views. Thank you for joining us. How many brought your Bibles with your church today? Amen. Got that word of God with you. Look at up high. Let's all shout out our affirmation together. Come on. God sent his word to me, and I expect it to speak to me and show me my purpose. Every day, I'm making progress in my purpose as I study and I live by God's word. You have your Bibles today. Psalm 16, verse 11 is where I want to go. Psalm 16, verse 11. I want to readdress uh, the series, His Presence and My Purpose. 
Thank you, Pastor Bruce, for last week sitting in for me. Uh, thank you so much. For that word of God you gave us uh, last week. And um, praise the Lord so much for a ready word. Uh, I, I, I want to get back into the whole idea of understanding the power of God's presence in our lives. Uh, I sensed him a few minutes ago just kind of wiping by us when uh, Sister uh, Harris was singing that song. And so I, I want to talk about today the joy of his presence. The joy of his presence. The joy of his presence. Um, same scripture. Heavy scripture. This is how heavy the Bible is. You can spend two months and never leave one scripture if you really study to show ourselves approved unto God. And I thank God for our church because we have a church of people that allow me to teach them the truth so that when people come up with these weird questions, Sharon, about why do you believe in God, you can say, because he brought me from my long way. That's one thing. But we can crack open a book and say, because God said this, yeah. and this is why this means this. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, so today, we're going to get back into that word. Help me read the 11th verse. The Bible says what? You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The joy of his presence. The joy of his presence. Come on, have take a seat where you are. We're constantly reminded, saints, um, of the challenges of the times we live in. Um, I'm so blessed when I see these children and, and the young folks doing great things. Yeah, yeah. Um, our teenagers, our, our young adults. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, notified, uh, Pastor Bruce, uh, a couple weeks ago that in, in many cultures, you're still young if you're under 50. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said, thank God. Okay, now. So you, 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 got, you got another chance. <laughs> And if you're between 50 and 70, you're just middle aged. You're not old yet. And if you're over 70, you get half price pancakes at, at uh, Wendy's and Jack in the Box and I have to know. But we're, we're often reminded these days, if, we, if you turn on the news anytime, uh, about all of the challenges we live in. I, I just saw this report dealing with some of our young people, and it's a new report from the agency based on collected youth risk behavior data. They found that teenagers overall are in a state of desperation yeah. with increases in debilitating sadness, violence, and suicidal ideation. When I grew up, I hate saying that, but when I grew up, yeah. when you were a young person, and that's when you had all your great ideas and all your, you know, thinking about the future. But unfortunately today, a lot of our children are being crippled by sadness, yeah. Yeah. crippled by violence. And this whole idea, this, this suicidal ideation means that they're coming up with different ways to take their own lives to cut short their own time. And I probably, if I spend enough time studying, I could figure out why a lot of this is happening. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of young people, as well as older people, don't understand what their purpose is. We've been talking about what the Hebrews call purpose or mezzanine or the original intent, why God made things. When you look in the Bible, everything he made, he said there's a purpose for it. When you look in Genesis, you'll notice that when he created things, he said, I made it and it does this. I made fish and they swim in this water. I made birds and they fly. I made trees where fruit would actually grow on it and it would produce food so that animals and people could live. Everything has a purpose, yeah. everything. Stars, sun, moon, gravity, all of it does. And we have young people today that cannot figure out their purpose because people keep redefining, realigning what they are. Yeah. Purpose is exercise during our lifetime. Somebody say lifetime. lifetime. I got caught up in that whole phrase this week, lifetime. 
God has blessed each of us with a lifetime. And if you take off life, it's just the word time. Somebody say time. time. What is time? T time is the indefinite continued progress of existence. You're all actually right now experiencing time. It's the events in the past. It's the events in the present. It's the events you don't know about that will happen in the future. And, and it's time is regarded as a whole. It's not just right now. It's not just yesterday. It's tomorrow. It's called time. My favorite definition, Royce, of time is the measure of eternity. We are not smart enough with all of our newfangled machinery and all the things we can do and all of our opinions. We can't figure out time. We cannot figure out eternity, so God gave us time. He gave us days and hours and months and weeks and seasons. But the thing about time, there are no two hours alike. There are no two hours alike. Every hour you live is unique. And when you read your Bible, what you'll notice is, is that the Bible seems more concerned with time than even space. Look in, look in your scripture. It pays more attention to generations than it does to things. Things are in here, but generations are in here more. It's more concerned with history than geography when you read your Bible. In time, things change. Somebody's lived long enough to know that you are glad you didn't give up when you were a junior in high school. It seemed like the world was ending when he left you. When he left you to go out with the, team, the, the, the cheerleader or when you got cut from the team, but time changes things. Time changes the way you look. Somebody. Time will change you more than makeup will. When you read the scripture, the first time God labeled anything holy in the Bible, because we always talk about holiness, and I believe in that, but, it, but if you look at the scriptures, Doc, it wasn't a mountain that God called holy first. It wasn't a star. It wasn't even a person. The first thing in the Bible God ever called holy was a piece of time. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 3, and God blessed the seventh day, and he made the day holy. There's something about the time you have that the devil will try to make you waste or lose or spoil your time. Because everything else around you can be reproduced, but you cannot get back your last birthday. It's a heavy thing when you wake up one day and realize, I just wasted a whole year of my life. Because you can't get it back. Every day we're privileged to live out our purpose in time. Somebody say time. It takes me back to two weeks ago when I mentioned uh, one of our key phrases that we should consider the results of God's presence in us. Even being here, we ask God to be here with us. And I need thee every hour. There's something about the presence of God that makes all the difference. I love this saying by Charles Finney. Would you read it with me? Finney said this about his presence. He said what? If the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. If the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out. God's presence is what makes the difference, even when it comes to coming to church on Sunday. Without the presence of God, all we are is a group of people gathered together to do something, whether we sing or whatever else. And sooner or later, what happens is if God is not in the church, the church becomes the club. There you go. It becomes the place we go to go find people to date and go out with and dance up and down the house. And nothing wrong with none of that, you know. But, but the reality is that God's presence makes the difference. Turn to somebody and say, God is good company. God is good company. Good people, they, there's nothing like time in God's presence. And so David wrote this down. He said, you will fill me with joy. Where? In your presence. Now, joy and happiness are emotions. 
Joy and happiness are emotions. And we are humans, and we all have some sort of emotion. What is an emotion? It's a natural, instinctive state of mind, deriving from one's circumstances, one's mood, one's relationships with others. Everybody gets emotional sometimes. Oh, yeah. Look at the person next to you. They look real stoic. <laughs> look like they ain't got no emotion. Uh, they don't laugh. They don't cry. They ain't got no personality. But put them in a setting uh -huh. that nature takes over. Yes. And we get emotional. Right. A few weeks ago, I was in the pulpit. I got emotional. Some of y'all got concerned. Don't get concerned. Just show I'm human. Right. You ever give them those messages on, on your computer say, check this, I'm not a robot? Yeah. That's me, I'm not a robot. Yeah. And so we have these emotions, and a couple of those emotions we talk about a lot, a lot in our society is joy and happiness. Now, the Bible that's in your lap uses the phrase uh, happy or happiness about 30 times between Genesis and Revelation. So it's in there. There's nothing wrong with being happy. Look at somebody and smile. There's nothing wrong with being happy. They smiling. Trust me, it's a faith thing. They're smiling. <laughs> happiness, <laughs> happiness is us. I just got happy right there. See, I got happy. Yeah. Happiness is a wonderful experience if you can happy. It, it's, it, but see, it's a duration that's usually coordinated with an event or happening. The birth of a child. She had a girl! I'm so happy! Okay, it, it's, it's coordinated around that. Um, I, I, and people are sending out graduation notices already for high school. I got one already. Papa send money. <laughs> There was nothing in that invitation, Telemar, about me coming to the graduation. It was just a cash app. That's all I got. There was no come on down to the hotel, nothing like that. So. But there's happiness tied around the graduation. Weddings. Happy event. Come be part of the happy event. So, so there's nothing wrong with happiness. But, but David said, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Didn't say it, you'd fill me with happiness in your presence. Happy, 30 times. If you look in the scripture, you will find the word joy or some derivative of it more than 300 times. 10 times more than happiness. Write down the word joy in your last 16 minutes. The word joy or the Hebrew word sava. It is an emotion that's acquired by the anticipation, acquisition, or even the expectation yeah. of something good, something great, or something wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Happiness is what happens yeah. when you go through the event. But joy is the thing that you receive expecting a thing to happen. Yeah. Happiness is the destination, but joy is the bridge that gets you from dark to light, from sad to happy, from bad to good. There's got to be something that keeps you sane on the days that are not Sunday, when it's not the graduation, when it's not the honeymoon. So David says, you fill me with joy in your presence. Joy lingers while happiness comes and goes. Some of y'all were happy last week. You're not happy right now. And people might think that you're a little paranoid schizophrenic because you keep changing. But the reality is that we are emotional. And unless we understand what emotions are, we let our emotions control who we are. God understood that. So joy keeps us before the thing is actually fulfilled. Somebody say joy. joy. There's another word that you will see in scripture called rejoice. Rejoice. The, 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 the old translation of rejoice means cause joy too. It is a bridge. It is it's when I get to joy, when joy is completed, then I rejoice. 
Does that make sense in church? In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, I know some of you all uh, want me to quote that verse and put it on the screen, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But most of the time when we say that verse, we are actually misquoting the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Because if you read the entire chapter, even the lines before you get to that verse, it is a time where the people of God are about to be on parole. Yes. They have messed up so bad before God that their lives have crumbled because they've left their first love. Yes. And so God begins to bring them back slowly. Some people you can't bring back right away. You got to bring them back slowly. Some things don't get fixed right away. Some marriages don't get fixed right away. Some kids don't get good overnight. Some people that get left out of prison need some parole time and an ankle bracelet. And so what God does, he begins to tell them, I want y'all to start eating right. Look at the scriptures, I want y'all to start eating right. Eat choice foods, do this, that, and the other. And he tells them, because you have forgotten what it was to walk with me. And as he gets to the end of that instruction, he says, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You've been living these weak lives. You've been living these ghetto lives. You need to repent. Go back to the penthouse. I need to take you back to where you need to be. Repent. Rejoice. Pent means pent up on the top of something. The nicest place in the biggest hotels is the penthouse. Mm. David understood that. For years, David had been on the run from King Saul. And as a fugitive, he had faced tremendous affliction, persecution. Somebody know what that's like, to have somebody after you, someone not like you, even though you're called to purpose. And it was in the season that he went through this that David wrote some of the most powerful songs he ever had. One of those is in Psalm 30. Psalm 30. David wrote a lot of things. In verse 30, he wrote this. He said, for his anger lasts only for a moment. His anger lasts only for him. Why would David talk about God's anger? How would he know about God's anger? Because even David disappointed God. I'm talking to somebody in church today. For his anger lasts only for a moment. But his favor lasts what? God's favor, write this in your notes, God's favor has no time limit. There's no expiration date on his favor. And David was talking about God's discipline. Now, I'm the America to understand something in my last 11 minutes, 57 seconds. If we sin against God, there's always a penalty for sin. Yes, we can repent and God, God will take care of us. But when nations, even in the Old Testament, when they that knew God would turn their back on God, when strong men and women of God would disappoint God, God would say, okay, I gotta put you in time out for a moment. You're not going to hell, but you're going to maybe go through some hell. So David was speaking of God's discipline. But David reminds us that sorrows we face in this life are temporary. I'm talking to somebody today. Sorrows that we face in this life are just temporary. A painful season, you know what it is? It's just a season. A painful season is just a season. There is a book I read, and they define it this way. They said a painful season, this is deep, Frank. He, it said, it's just a while. It's just a while. There, there was no uh, calendar, but it said, it's just a while. You're, you're, there's a season called the night season. And the night season is the dark time between the bright times. See, when it gets dark, it's just dark. Daytime has phases, morning, noon, afternoon, sunset, nighttime, dark. And so David writes in Psalm 30, verse 5, his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. And he finishes with this, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes. Yeah. Weeping. Here is David talking about, David is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not 
wants his day. But David understood what it means to weep. The word weep means to shed tears. It is an emotion tied to an event, and sometimes you cry. Sometimes you cry because you're happy, but that ain't too often. It's a pain in your heart or in your life. The Bible says it might stay for the night. It might stay for that night season. But rejoicing or joy comes in the morning. Why the night? The night is when things are magnified. You cannot compare a bad day to a bad night. They don't match at all. As long as it's daytime outside, you can kind of go through things and, and do things. But when nighttime comes, it just seems like it never ends. Yeah. Even if you have a simple cold, Sister Ernestine. Yeah. A cold at night. Somebody, somebody came up with this miracle drug called NyQuil. <laughs> it don't heal nothing. But what it does, it knocks you out. When you wake up, your nose still running. But you slept through the night, right? There's something about being lonely during the day, but there's something about being alone at night. It's just when you're used to having that around. Sadness is sad during the day. Even grief is bad during the day. But at night, the Bible says, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. In the midst, when you read the scripture, what you realize, in the midst of David's personal struggle, Anybody in church ever had personal struggles? When, when things seem the darkest and the most uncertain, that's when he wrote these words. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes along. He was not feeling good. He said rejoicing will come, even though you cry in the nighttime. Sama is coming. It's going to get better. Talking to somebody in church. A lot of times David would call out to God in, his, in, his, uh, in the worst times of his life. I don't have time to go through all of this chapter, but if you go in Psalm 30, go all the way down to verse number 11. David testifies as how things change for him. Would y'all read verse 11 with me? The Bible says God, about him in God's presence. This is what happened. He said what? You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove Man, I wish I had time to explain to you the realness of this text. The realness, not the romantic David, not the one on TV. The guy that became the king and did all these great things, but had to go through certain situations. David said, God, you turned my wailing, circle that in your, in your notes. The word wailing means prolonged, high-pitched screams of agony. He went from weeping in verse 5 to wailing in verse 11. Yeah. There are times when pain is so rough in your life that your, your, your cries yes. turns into words that can't even be uttered. Oh, oh. Funeral clothes. 
And you clothe me with joy. You, you, you. And, and remember what joy is, saints, in the last three minutes. Joy is what you expect even better than what you have right now. This world gives us many reasons to despair. Tony, this world gives us many reasons to break down. Even our own sin can cause God to discipline us. Dark nights can last a long time. But no night lasts forever. And, 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 and sometimes I notice in church, Sister Monica, that the people of God have not tapped into the presence of God because we all go through something. Yeah. 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 Turn to somebody and say, you too. <laughs> Some of y'all just hide it better than other folks. Right, 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 right. We all go through something. Stay black long enough, you will go through something. And one of the things we do, we run away yeah, yeah. instead of deal with it or let God deal with it. Yeah. And if we run away from the presence of God, there's a void in our lives. I love what Tozer said about that. Read with me. We're almost done. Tozer said what? There is a strain of loneliness infecting many Christians, which only the presence of God can cure. You can go cruise, you can go to the mountains, you can go to the mall, you can go on vacation. Good things to do. Last week I, I, I went out to Arizona for a while and then I, I didn't realize how dumb I was. I did not realize that the Super Bowl was there when I was there. So I left Arizona. I, the prices started going up high at the hotel. I'm like, why is Super Bowl coming? I'm a football fan. How come I didn't know Super Bowl was right down the street from me? Some of y'all might have saw a guy with a Detroit Lions cap on ESPN walking behind those guys. It looked like me. That was me. I was there. I was there. I was, I was there for a minute, but I left there and I went to Las Vegas for our time trips. I didn't want to come back home right away. I just needed some time away to clear my head. My wife and I talked about it. Sometimes you just need a time away, right? I, and, and so I went out to Vegas for, for a few days and I walked around. I didn't gamble because I, I, it's hard to get my money. I can't give it to somebody I don't know. I, I did walk through some casinos. I just never stopped. I just kept on walking. Went over there to Ocean's Eleven, saw that fountain go up and all that. Had some pancakes and all that kind of thing. Walked a lot and saw a lot of different stuff. But the one thing I did not do, I did not tell God, stay in Chicago while I go to Arizona. I said, could you go with me? But I need to go walk. And when I go walk, my whole life, the place I pray that is when I'm taking long, long, long walks. There's some things only the presence of God can cure. When you read the scripture, I'm almost done, brother, brother I get it. When you read the New Testament, one of the things we notice in the New Testament is that Paul was convicted for preaching the gospel. And he heard these heavy metal doors close behind him. And he sat in prison for two years. He said, that ain't that long. You try sitting in prison for two days. For two years, this man of God was locked away for doing nothing more but fulfilling his purpose. And you would think, what a horrible, horrible thing, all of this wasted time, but God was there. And do you not know those two years he spent in prison, he wrote at least four books of the New Testament while he was in prison. Somehow, his situation squeezed the juice of life out of him. And the oil of God came into his spirit. He began to write letters. And those letters were so anointed and so, for, so from God that they became part of the Bible. Some of y'all think y'all locked away from God, but the Bible says that David said, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Before we leave here today, I, I need you to be encouraged because there are some teenagers that need to hear from you. There are a lot of teenagers, not just white teenagers or Korean teenagers or Chinese teenagers, but a lot of black teenagers. Frank, you work with them. You coach some of them. Quincy, you work with them. Some of you work with them. And some of y'all are afraid of the very children that need what you got. They need to know that no night lasts forever. 
And I'm saying to even some of you today, some of you watching today, you might feel hopeless. You might feel discouraged. You might feel afflicted in this moment. You might be unable to see the light right now, but it's coming. It's coming. The Bible says joy comes in the morning. And here's the thing about morning, it always has to come. Because man is the only thing that made God repeat itself. Everything that God told him, you have to do this, he's been doing it. What's his time began? So your morning is coming. As we go today, there, there, I'm reminded of a verse. I heard you say that um, you watched this old movie and uh, about Fanny Hamer's movie and talked about some of the things that they talked about and why she sang certain songs. Um, there's a verse that back in New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, I used to hear the old saints quote, I'm like a tree. I had no idea what they were talking about. Jeremiah, the prophet, he wrote something down, and I'm going to put it on the screen. You may not have time to read it, but this verse is about God's presence for those people that go through difficult circumstances. And I think if you read it out loud, Maybe it'll speak to your soul. Frank, it spoke to mine. Read it, it says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And I'll put some, put some feeling behind trust in the Lord. Whose confidence is in him. Verse eight, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. It leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Oh, if I had another 15 minutes, I would help you to understand that this is you in the presence of God. He said, blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in God, in the presence of God. Why? Because he or she, they, will be like a tree. Not a tree, but like a tree. It's, it, we are, he uses nature to explain the supernatural. Some people don't understand how you made it all this way. Through all the you've been through. But I'm like a tree, the writer said, whose roots are by the stream, planted by the water. Here's the thing about it. Everybody's rooted somewhere. And if your roots are near something that can feed into your life, no matter what happens around you, what happens inside of you will never change. You stay strong no matter how weak things are around you. And so if you go out to the farm, no, just when you come in here, there ain't but two real trees on this land. They're right there in the front. And them trees are as old as Methuselah. Almost everything around here got cut down, but there was something, remember when we first came out here, how those trees looked at each other? And we kind of said, man, that's kind of weird. But we didn't realize there's something under this ground called groundwater. And so when they began to dig that, that pond out there, when you come through that triangle looking thing out there, that's about five stories deep, water start coming up from under the ground. That's not just rainwater. That's groundwater, and that's living water. And there are some times when we have dry weeks and dry months and dry seasons, but them two old trees, they always have leaves on them. Matter of fact, we're at the place now we gotta trim them back because they gotten too big. And their life does not come from the village of Linwood. That life does not come from the rain that falls. Nobody gets out there with a water hose and waters the trees. I know you gotta water the plants in the back, but they are temporary, they are for nourishment. The trees are for something else. Yeah. The prophet said, Jeremiah said, yeah. if you stay close to God, yeah. no matter what happens around you, if your spouse start acting crazy, yeah. if your boss start acting crazy, yeah. if white folks start acting crazy, yeah. if black folks start acting crazy, 
you, you don't have to crumble behind that. Because it does not fear when heat comes. It does not run to jewels and try to get water when the heat comes. Because it's, it's, it's water comes from underneath it. Its leaves are always green. It's always in season. Why? Because it is not determined by what happens outside. Green leaves happen because what happens from inside. That's why Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. The vines have the life in it. You are the branch. All you have to do is hold what I produce that comes through you. It has no worries in the year of drought. Some of us, our biggest concern is worry. Now, I tell y'all, there's sometimes I get worried. Not, oh, worried, but I just get worried of people. It becomes troublesome. Can I say that in church? I'm a pastor, so I can say that. Y'all come here for 90 minutes and you worship and you pay your tithes. I appreciate all that. But, but some of us don't never go home. And we deal with all the crazy stuff that people do. And God is teaching me, after 50 years of being a Christian, 47 years of being a preacher, that the reason you have to stress about all this around you is because you will never fail to bear fruit. Yeah. That's right. What does that mean? Close your Bible, close your Bible. What does that mean? It means that fruit is the result of the process. What you all are right now, you're the fruit of this ministry. Dr. Claude and Dr. Addy have been dead for years. They've been in heaven a long time now. I know, I preached both their funeral. Yeah. Reverend Bell has been gone since 2015. Yeah. It's, been, it's been eight years, yeah. nine years, eight years. I know, because I preached their funeral. Yeah. And I understand all the greatness that they have. And somebody feels that all the anointing major has been on them. But it's not them, it's the process of God. They were just branches. Yeah. All this black history we're talking about, those were just the branches. Dr. King been dead for over 50 years. But there's still fruit on the tree. You know why? Because they're planted by the water, by the river. There's a joy being in the presence of God. And I want to thank you for tuning in today. Your presence today helps me to realize that there's still some oil left in, in the tank. And God is saying something to you that's going to help you make it to your next step in life. You might need somebody to pray for you. There's a number on the screen right now. And there's some great people. I know them personally. They are prayer warriors. We have a place in our building called the War Room. Sometimes they just huddle in there and they pray. Sometimes they pray at home. Sometimes they pray in the car. But every prayer that's requested, they fall on their face before God about. Let us pray for you today. Maybe you need some questions answered. Maybe you're looking for a new church home. Call that number, leave us your information, um, we'll get right back to you. Know that God loves you and he's with you right now. Baby, you ain't never been alone. Whether you're weeping, wailing, or dancing, God has always been there. God loves to dance, but he is not intimidated by tears. So whatever you're dealing with, don't be embarrassed about it. Take it to God today. He wants to be there for you and fill your life with joy. Give our audience a hand as they go today. And now it's time to give. Those of you that are watching our broadcast online via Facebook or YouTube, if this is your week to give your tithes and offering, you may do so via PayPal or Tithely. You can also mail your payment into our post office box located in the city of Glenwood or Come up to the church office during our office hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And if you're visiting with us, please be sure to give your tithes to your church home. However, if this ministry has been a blessing to you and you'd like to sow a seed in good soil, we'll be sure you will receive a receipt for your contributions. God bless you. You can give through these portals on the screen as well. And thank you. The Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's say amen and may God bless you.